So we're going to go back and just review the idea of polyatomic ions since most of the content on pages 172 through 176 have been covered by the videos. But again, we want to talk concepts here. And, and when we're talking about polyatomic ions right now, you all maybe feel like you can get inside the polyatomic ion and start to try to figure out all the different bonds and maybe even start thinking in terms of bond angles when we start doing geometries on Monday and, and stuff like that. I really don't want you to worry about that for right now. Just go through and memorize the polyatomic ion and know the formula for it and to know the charge for it and know the name of it. Don't worry about figuring out the bonds in, inside. Yes, sir? This is an important polyatomic ion. So are there more? There are more. Just those. And even Tyler on his video said, here's a list that I like. Your teacher or your book may have given you more or another list. But the most common ones are in this 14. Okay. So if you understand these 14, you can figure out other ones as well. Now for the polyatomic ion consideration, I kind of want to just back up a little bit and not worry about, we've been doing Lewis structures and Lewis diagrams for bonds. And that's going to become real important again when we do geometries, but it's not as significant for the polyatomic ions because the concept here being is that a polyatomic ion is a covalent molecule. We talked about that. So whatever the polyatomic ion is, whatever the polyatomic ion is, I'm just going to use a, a circle to represent the whole molecule. Whatever it is, the components inside, the building blocks, the elements that make that up, they are bound to one another covalently. Because they're bound to one another covalently, what do we know about the types of elements that make it up? Are there any metals? If there were a metal, what would that mean would have to be happening inside there? It would be ionic bonding, right? It wouldn't be covalent bonding. So the polyatomic ions are covalently bonded molecules, which means that all of the components that make it up are nonmetals. So a polyatomic ion is a molecule that's held together covalently, meaning there are non, no metals in it. And again, if you think inside of it, the little, little building blocks inside all have bonds, little bars on our, vec on our um, Lewis diagrams that are holding it together. And that's what keeps that chunk of the bigger molecule. Because what we're doing is we're basically taking a molecule and adding something to it to make a bigger molecule. Rather than taking an atom and another atom to build a molecule, we're taking a molecule and another atom or molecule to build a larger structure. So we're doing, we use polyatomic ions. So though I represent it as one circle, inside that circle in your mind think, hey, there's a bunch of elements in here, but they're all hooked together like an erector set. And they together form this molecule which acts like an ion. Up until this point, every time we've talked about ions, we've talked about individual atoms, right? And individual atoms which are neutral, we refer to that just as the atom, or an individual atom which has either gained or lost electrons, giving it a net charge. Right? So when the number of electrons equals the total number of protons, not simply the valence shell, but the total number of protons equals the total number of electrons, we say that the charge of that atom is neutral. But when it loses electrons, it becomes positive, or when it gains electrons from neutral, it becomes negative. And when that happens, that's when opposite charges start attracting and molecules begin forming ionically. Okay. So now we have, rather than just one atom that has a charge, now we have an entire molecule, an entire structure of atoms inside that has a net charge. The thing that makes it confusing sometimes is that we have potassium, for example, that might have a positive one charge, and calcium that might have a positive two charge, and aluminum with a positive three charge. And we think of individual atoms as having charges of one, two, and three positive, or maybe on the other side, nitrogen having a negative three, or oxygen a negative two, or fluorine a negative one charge. And so we're used to the numbers one, two, and three, positive or negative, being associated with an individual atom. Now those net charges of positive or negative one, two, or three become associated with a molecule. So remember from yesterday, again, this is all review from yesterday, but maybe said a little different way, that inside of here we've got multiple atoms hooked together. And overall, between all of them, counting up all of their protons and all of their electrons for all of the atoms that make up the polyatomic ion, there's a difference of charge of one, two, or three, positive or negative. Okay? So you might have four atoms that have a net charge of two negative. That doesn't mean that any one individual atom is 
too negative. What that means is considering the whole lump, the whole molecule together, it in its totality has a negative one, negative two, plus one, whatever charge. So that if we consider the, in the whole polyatomic ion to be just one item, then we can see how it can react and interact with other atoms or polyatomic ions which also have a net charge. A net charge that's opposite of theirs so that they are attracted to it to form an ionic bond which is the second half of the bonding that takes place. So it's covalent inside the polyatomic ion. It's ionic between the polyatomic ion and the other matter that it's connecting to to form the overall molecule. All right, so in the book Walking through 173, there's a definition of polyatomic ion there, the ions that are formed when a group of atoms gains or loses electrons. A group of atoms there means a molecule. It's not just, hey, a bunch of sodium was hanging out and an extra electron came in. No, that's not what we're talking about. A group of atoms means it's a molecule already. It's formed. And that group of molecules gains or loses an electron. Now, yesterday we started talking about this idea of sodium hydroxide and how a sodium hydroxide might form talked about OH, we know now that internally, if I were to draw it as a Lewis structure, we have an oxygen and a hydrogen that form this type of bond, that there were six original electrons around the oxygen, one around the hydrogen, and they form a covalent molecule by sharing these two electrons so that hydrogen's octet is full because it has two, remember it's exception, only needs two. Hydrogen is filled with two, and oxygen now sees seven, it needs one more. It needs to find a stray electron, if you will, in order for the oxygen octet to be completed. Now, one way that it could fulfill that octet would be to form another molecule with another hydrogen. And what do we have? What is that known as? H2O, we call it water, okay? Water is an hydroxide is a hydroxide polyatomic ion with, but rather than just picking up an electron, it bonds with another hydrogen, and rather than becoming a polyatomic ion of hydrogen, of hydroxide, excuse me, it's water. And in this, this case, we've got two around the hydrogen of each of them, so they're satisfied. Two, four, six, eight around the oxygen, it's satisfied, so we have a molecule of water. This is gonna become later, important later on when we do acid and base reactions. We start neutralizing bases and acids because we're gonna have hydroxides forming water all the time. Because an acid, an acid is a chemical that's donating hydrogens. And hydro hydroxides are out there begging for a hydrogen. And together they're gonna form water. Okay. Where we are right now though, you've got a hydroxide ion looking for one more electron so it can complete itself. Okay? Looking for that one more electron. Now, where, in we, where would we get electrons from? What are the elements we've been talking about so far that want to give up electrons? Metals. Metals are trying to get rid of electrons. Right? So metals are looking for a way to get rid of them. Here we've got a hydroxide that's begging for one. Wouldn't it be convenient if there were a metal nearby that could donate one? Well, in the example in the book, let's say that there is a sodium nearby. And it's going to happen in much the same way as happened with sodium chloride. In sodium chloride, we just had two, <coughs> two atoms, two atoms that were near each other, a metal and a nonmetal. So it's not going to be, this is not what's going to happen. It's not going to form that kind of a bond because sodium is trying to get rid of it, not trying to get. It's trying to get rid of. And so what sodium is going to do is give up its electron and chlorine is going to take it. And then they're going to form, uh, they're going to have opposite charges and attract one another, right? Now in the same way over here, we've got a sodium and a hydroxide. From sodium's perspective, it's the same thing as if a chlorine came by. Sodium is trying to get rid of an electron. The hydroxide is trying to get, right? What it's gonna do is this one electron here is going to fill in the octet of 
of the oxygen. So what do we have now? It looks exactly like the sodium and chlorine, right? The sodium was attracted to the chlorine and the chlorine was attracted to the sodium. Why? Opposite charges. Before, we had an equal number of electrons and protons, but the octet wasn't full. Now the octet is full, but because of that, this molecule here, this whole molecule here now, all together, has what charge? It's gained one electron, so it has a one negative. Sodium has lost one electron. It now has a one positive. What's going to happen when you have the sodium and the hydroxide together, equal but opposite charges? Boom. They're going to be attracted to one another, and they're going to form an ionic bond right in here. They're going to be attracted to one another. And so just like sodium got attracted to chlorine, sodium is attracted to hydroxide because of equal but opposite charges pulling them together. So again, ionic bond holding the sodium to the hydroxide, covalent bond holding the hydrogen to the oxygen. Now in this right here, which of these two bonds is the hardest to break up? It's easy, we talked about covalent bonds. We said we have single, double, triple bonds. So like the, the triple bond between nitrogen is the hardest to break, and then we've got the double bond between oxygen, which is hard to break, and then we've got you know, a single bond between chlorines, which is, you know, you break it kind of a thing. So triple bonds are harder than doubles, and doubles are harder than singles. But now we've got a ionic bond and a covalent bond of these two, which is the hardest to break. The covalent is harder to break. So in the future, we're going to deconstruct this and react this. Where are we going where, where to anticipate the break coming? Do we think that hydrogen and oxygen are going to break first, or what's probably going to happen? the sodium and the hydroxide are going to separate first. Easier. Okay, and that's what we'll look to see. But for right now, we're talking about building and reacting. And so sodium and hydroxide take on opposite but equal charges. And because they're opposite, they attract. And because they're equal, once they touch, once they come together, they neutralize. Okay? In the same way, this polyatomic ion could have a negative 2 charge or a negative 3 charge. Let's say that this, we use a different polyatomic ion here. Let's say it's... um a chlorite, a ClO2, what do we want to use? No, let's use something with a higher charge, a chromate. A chromate ion, polyatomic ion, Poly it has a negative 2 charge. So let's say that we have chromates in the vicinity of sodiums. So what would my end molecule look like? What would be my formula for sodium chromate? Let's pretend like chromate is, remember they said you've got to memorize them because you're not going to find them on the periodic table. But let's pretend that we're doing something like sodium, um, sodium sulfide. Sulfide, yeah. Sodium sulfide. I know that sodium and sulfur are involved. And I asked you, what is the molecular formula for sodium sulfide? You go, well, sodium and sulfide are involved. A metal and a nonmetal, it's going to be ionic. What do I do? I go and I check the charges. What charge does this want to become in its ionic form? Sodium wants to become one positive. Sulfur wants to become two negative. So the formula for sodium sulfide is... Now, the way that we taught in here is transpose, right, to become sodium, okay? The way Tyler did it, he said, I've got one, I've got two, I need another one, so one, two, and one. Yeah, it comes out to be this. Now, no magic here. Now, rather than using sodium and sulfur, my two components are sodium and chromate. What is the formula for sodium chromate? Well, sodium wants to take on a plus one charge. Chromate, you can't look at the table and find what column it's in because it's a polyatomic ion, but because you've memorized it, and you know that chromate has a two negative charge. Now we're gonna do the same thing. Sodium two chromate. Why? Because this whole 
chromate polyatomic ion acts like, it's a molecule that acts like an atom. It stays together, but it has a charge, and it has to bond in proportion to neutralize the charge. So we need two positive to neutralize two negative, and because of that logic, we need two sodiums to neutralize the two negative charge of one chromate polyatomic ion. Okay. So if you can build ionic bonds, molecules using ionic bonding by their charges, you can do the same thing with polyatomic ions, remembering that you're going to keep this whole thing together. If, for example, we used, let's go back to hydroxide because it's nice and convenient as a negative one. Let me erase this. See, we have a hydroxide, an OH. For now, I'm just going to box it just so we can get kind of a paradigm going here. We know that hydroxide has a negative one charge. And let's go ahead and use calcium. So we're going to make calcium hydroxide. Okay, calcium is a metal. Hydroxide is a negative polyatomic ion. We're going to form an ionic bond between the two. Calcium, what is the ionic form preference for calcium? Calcium wants to become two positive, right? Hopefully now this is almost automatic. You almost don't even have to look at the board anymore, right? Calcium is two positive. Why? Call them two A element. How do you know? Because I've seen it a bazillion times already, Mr. Baker. There's only 20 or so that we had to memorize, and it's one of them. And man, we've been over it so many times. Calcium is a column two A element, mean it wants to become a plus two charge for its ion. Hydroxide has a negative one charge. So when these combine ionically to form a molecule, their formula is going to be cross and transpose, right? C A O H. But now I need to represent two of them, right? I need two at minus one each to balance out one at two plus. I need two hydroxides. And if you remember in the video yesterday, the way we do that is we put parentheses around the molecule and then subscript it. So two, calcium hydroxide. This shows me that I have one calcium ion and two hydroxide polyatomic ions. And these two combine to neutralize the charge so that it has a net zero charge. How many calciums are in this molecule? One. How many oxygens are in this molecule? Two. How many hydro hydrogens? Two. Now you may have, for example, within the polyatomic ion, have a multiple. Here we got chromate, right? If I, in this case, it was Na2, but let's use something different. Let's, let's make it aluminum chromate. Let's, let's, let's build up the molecule of aluminum chromate. Aluminum. Metal, polyatomic ion, this metal of aluminum, it wants to become what charge? Aluminum. aluminum. No. Aluminum is a metal still. Right? Aluminum wants to become positive and it wants to lose three. Right? Column three A element? Okay. Column three A element on the metal side. So it wants to become three positive. Chromate, a CrO4 molecule, has a net two negative charge. What is the formula for aluminum chromate? Well, if you do the transpose method, it's going to be Al2 chromate 3, right? Because I have this whole CrO4 molecule, and that whole molecule has a two negative charge. And to balance out, I need three of them. To each one of these is minus two, a negative two. Three at negative two is a total of negative six. Right? And aluminum is a three positive. Every one of them is three positive, and I have two of them. And to multiply together, uh, that means I have six positives. So six positive, six negative, they cancel. This is my molecule. Now the question is, how many aluminums are in this molecule? Two. How many chromates or chromiums, excuse me? 
3, this times the subscript here, so BCR implied 1, right? So I have three sets of 1, and then how many oxygens? 12 oxygens. I've got a set of 4 for every chromate, and three chromates, so it's three sets of four to make 12. Yeah, just multiply, yeah, just within the polyatomic ion, you're gonna multiply the subscripts times the, sup the subscript of the entire molecule. So it's three and 12. Three times four is 12, three times one is three, and then two just subscripts aluminum. So two aluminums, three chromiums, and 12 oxygens in a molecule of aluminum chromate, okay? So you can see both building and building the molecules by their charges. So if you were, s if, if the, the quiz could say, what is the formula for aluminum chromate? You would have to know, first of all, aluminum, column three element, that's a metal that wants to become positive, so positive three. Chromate, you need to, need to know that chromate is a CrO4 molecule that has a net two negative charge, so that you could do this, and then you would do the same process we did last module, of transposing and subscripting the charges to come up with the formula. Now, if you remember what yesterday on Tyler's video, what he did is he would say, okay, three and two, I need more of both of them. Not smart. Not smart. Oh, well, put your head up anyway because you slept through the video, so I'm trying to repeat them for you. Okay, so aluminum chromate over here too. Aluminum chromate. So... I got two negative, three positive. I know I need more of chromium, right? I know I need more of chromium, so let me do another chromium. Okay, so now I have, and this one's two negative. So now I have four negative and three positive. I know I need more positive. So aluminum three. But now it's six and four. Now I need another chromium. So it's two, four, six, three, three is six. There's my balance. It's aluminum two, chromium three. As process, that's not always going to work. I'd rather you stick with this process for now. It'll help you. That that technically will work, but the principle behind it, I think, is more important. So subscripting the charges is the way that we taught it in here, and the way Tyler did it yesterday in the videos was just to keep adding until the charges match. And then make sure there's no common, you know, take the greatest common factor, but three and two is going to be the, you know, Chromate three. Yeah, it'd be aluminum two like we had before. Aluminum two because here's one, there's two. So aluminum two and then three different chromates to become three. I do too, but some people don't get that, so maybe the other way helps them think about it. And like Will said, it may work, but I don't want to give three options. I don't want to go too far, you know? So I give the way that I recommend you do it. The second way that Tyler did it, this is pretty simple too. Then the third way might work for you, and if it works, it's fine. I still want to offer it as an option to the whole class because if one of these two don't appeal to you, that's going to become confusing. So, you know, your best option if you don't get it is to use one of those two methods that we've already done here. But I want to give you the option if you don't understand the way I, I've been doing it with transposing the charges as subscripts. I want you to at least be able to see what's actually happening. And this is very visual, right? I need three of those to neutralize two of those. And that's how I write it. <coughs> All right, so if you join me on page 175, we're going to walk through example 5.1. And they give us three different three different molecules that we build up <coughs> what is the chemical formula for calcium nitrate calcium Nitrate. Now it's very easy to mix up the eights and the ites 
both in the name and in the formula. Both in the name and the formula. One of the hints that I have written down in my notes is when you're memorizing the table, the table on 5-1 right there on page 175, if an ion ends in an oxygen, which a lot of them do, then it has either an eight or an ite name. So nitrate, it ends in an oxygen. If you go through the list and look at all the, nit all the ites and all the eights, they all end in an oxygen. Now, also the, the pattern is, if it has more oxygens, it's the eight, and if it has fewer oxygens, it's the ite. For example, if you look at sulfate and sulfite, sulfate has four oxygens in it, sulfite has three oxygens in it. So if you memorize sulfate or sulfite, sulfite, right, you can figure out the other one if you remember that the eights have more and the ites have less. Just, just something if it helps. So calcium nitrate. What is the atom, or excuse me, the uh, chemical symbol for calcium? Okay, C A. What is the chemical chemical symbol for nitrate? Nitrate is N O three. And calcium wants to become two positive, right? Ide. Yeah, but in your list here, all of them, almost all of them end in an ite, right? An eight or an ite. Check the other side of the list. Hmm? No, an ide is, this is, see, a nitrate, NO3, a nitrite, NO2, a nitride is just nitrogen, right? Nitride, remember, ide names are the Elemental ion names. So if you see what is calcium nitride, then I'm talking about ions of calcium and ions of nitrogen. Because nitride is the ionic name of nitrogen atoms that have become ions. Nitride. But nitrates and nitrites are a polyatomic ion, which is a covalent molecule that includes nitrogens and oxygens bound together. So a nitrate and a nitrite are very different from a nitride. A nitride is an ion of nitrogen. A nitrate and a nitrate. Nitrate and nitrite are molecules that include nitrogen and oxygen. One has three oxygens, the other has two oxygens. Okay? So eight and ite lead you to know that it's a polyatomic ion. Ide means it's an element that has become an ion. And then the hint was eights and ites tell you fewer or lesser. Now it's not always true that ites have this many and eights have that many. It just always means relative to one another, the eight molecule has more oxygens than the ite. Does, does that make sense? Do you want me to show you at least one example of that, what I mean by that? Okay, I will. Here we've got nitrate, which is NO3. We also have nitrite. A nitrite polyatomic ion is NO2, and it also has a negative one charge, okay? So we have a nitrate and a nitrite. See here that the nitrate has three oxygens. If I know that the nit if the eight has more, that means the ite must have less than three, and it does, it has two. Or if I remember, hey, I'm on, on this quiz, and I remember that nitrite has NO2, I know that nitrate must have more than two. It has three. See how that works? So if I remember one of them, I know the other one is more or less based upon whether I remember the nitrate or remember the nitrite. The only other one on there that's not an eight or an ite is the ide, uh, hydroxide, the OH minus one, which get familiar with it. We're going to use it almost every day, an uh, hydroxide polyatomic ion. And those are all the negative ones. There's only one positive polyatomic ion that you have to memorize, and that's the aluminum. Oh, excuse me, the ammonium. The ammonium polyatomic ion. Ammonia is NH3. Ammonia looks like a nice covalent molecule, NH3. Ammonium is NH4. It 
So monium. It would naturally have one extra electron there, but there's no place for it in the octet of nitrogen. So it loses that one nitrogen and becomes a plus one charge. See, because here there's two, four, six, eight. Another hydrogen comes along with its one. It's not needed to complete the octet of nitrogen. So when this bond forms, they have an extra electron that they cast off. And some poor negative polyatomic ion out there is going, there it is, poof, grabbing it. I need that. Okay. So here's the difference between ammonium and ammonia. Ammonia is a neutral molecule, covalent molecule. Ammonium is a polyatomic ion. Okay. So right now we're dealing with calcium nitrate. So we, looked, we remember or we looked and saw that it's a column 2A element, wants to become 2 positive. Nitrate is an NO3 molecule, has a 1 negative charge. And so what is the formula for calcium nitrate? And again, they walk you through that in the book. But just as we've already done, the charges, bring the, bring the charges down, transpose them as subscripts, and write your molecule out, which means for calcium, we have one. For nitrogen, we have two. And for oxygens, we have six. You should see that there is one calcium, two times one nitrogens, and two times three oxygens in that molecule. So if I said, what do I need to build a molecule of calcium nitrate, what elements and how many, you would say you need one calcium, two nitrogens, and six oxygens. Magnesium phosphate is the next one they offer. Magnesium phosphate. Magnesium is Mg. Phosphate is PO4. I'm just going to put the bracket around it right now. Okay, you don't need the bracket when it's by itself, but I, I'll go ahead and do that since we know we're looking at that polyatomic ion. <coughs> what is the charge of the phosphate polyatomic ion? You just have to have it memorized. But three negative, okay, it's three negative. And the magnesium ion, what does, it, what does magnesium want to ionize to become? Two positive. Two positive. So... Two different ways of doing this. The way that I taught you, drop the charges, transpose as subscripts becomes Mg3PO42. Or the way that Tyler did it, I have Mg2 plus PO4 with 3 minus. Okay. 3 and 2, I need more magnesiums. Magnesium. 4 and 3, I need more, more phosphates. 6 and 4, I need more magnesiums. 6 and 6, I'm done. My formula is Mg123, phosphate 1, 2. I would. I would do one of them, and if time permitted on the exam or something, Check it the other way. Make sure your, your head works right. This right here is just logic. This one here is process, in my mind. This one here is I understand the concept, boom, boom, boom. This one is, hey, I figured out a way to do this. I've proven it before. Let me just do, let me just do it. Because doing this, this comes from seeing this pattern over and over again, right? And saying, hey, I need to have balanced charges. How do I do that? It's going to be a function of those charges and it functions in in opposites I need two of this to balance three of them you know like that and lastly copper one acetate okay copper one acetate so we'll take what we learned from the last module about the ion copper one and we know copper see you yes I can Copper 1 means what charge does it have? Now, we're not going to bother to go over here and look anywhere, are we? Where is copper at? Copper is over here. It's a column 11. It's a 1B element. Okay. 
What does that tell you about what, how it wants to ionize? Nothing, really. That's why they have to tell you it's a copper one. Copper in, in here, copper, Roman numeral one. What does the Roman numeral one mean? It wants to become one positive. It's a metal. It wants to take on a charge of one. Since it's a metal, it's a positive one. So copper is going to have a positive one charge, and I'm going to marry that up with some acetate molecules. An acetate, it's a C2H3O2. C2H3O2 molecule. And what does acetate have as its charge? Negative one? Okay. Do you see almost instinctively this is like sodium chloride? It's a it's a one to one. So my total molecule is going to be Cu C two H three O two. I don't need to put parentheses around this because there's only one of them. And I don't put the subscript ones because it's always implied. If it wasn't at least a one, it wouldn't be there. If you included zeros, then you would have every element that there is up there with a zero under it, except for these four elements which have numbers underneath it. Right? That's why we don't bother with putting ones because that would imply we have to write the ones with zeros. So copper one has it's one not because it was copper one, but because it has a charge of plus one and it takes one of them to neutralize the one negative from the acetate. And this is the molecule. Now, if the formula did work out that I needed two acetates or three acetates or whatever, then I would put parentheses around the acetate and then I would subscript it over here. Now, you're going to see molecules later on too where there might be places where, for example, it might have another, and again, this is an improper molecule. I'm just making this up right now. But let's say that there was another copper out here or excuse me, another carbon out there in this chain. It's an even longer chain. There's a copper there. And you say, wait a minute, there's a copper there. Or excuse me, I'm saying copper, I mean carbon. There's a carbon here, somewhere out in front of, and there's carbons here. Can't we just take this carbon here and draw it like that? Chemists tend not to do that because when they have a polyatomic ion, there's a structure there. They tend to want to keep it together. So even if there's another carbon someplace else, someplace else in the formula, they're going to keep this as a C2 because in their minds, they remember that, hey, wait a minute, this right here comes from an acetate. It's already bound together with hydrogens and oxygens. It's already a molecule in and of its own right. Just because I have another carbon in the, the larger chemical, the larger structure, the larger molecule, doesn't mean that that carbon is automatically interacting with the carbons from the polyatomic ion. And so it, it starts a little bit different than you're used to where you might see the same element show up more than once in a chemical formula. But the reason that is, is they tend to keep the polyatomic ions all together as a group. Because as a chemist, you sit back and you're looking at this long chain of elements that make up a molecule, and you might see a carbon, but then later on you're going to see a C2H3O2. You're going to go, oh, that's my acetate. That's my, much like my add-on, my plug-in. It's my acetate that's been joined into this other chain of elements. And yes, it contains an element that's somewhere else in the molecule as well, but I'm still going to show it together so I don't break up my acetate. So in terms of your atom count, it doesn't make a difference. But in terms of when you try to build the structure, you're going to know to keep the acetate together because it's a, it's a structure that was then plugged into the other structure. Mm-hmm. Mm hmm Yep. They have to. Yeah, unless it's in the S or P, which you can do quickly, they've got to give it to you. And as a matter of fact, if it's the S, they'll give it to you. If it's in the S, you can figure it out easily. The D block proper, and then also down here into the transition metals down here, like the one we had on the uh, exam with lead, right? Lead takes on multiple ions as well because the, the ones that they have to give you include the D block proper and then also these lower extended transition metals. You can't look at lead and say lead is always going to be four. Now there is a lead four, but it's not only lead four. I think there's a lead two as well. Okay. So and that's because down here you're getting way down on the ionization energy relative to the top, electronegativity, radius, all these other things start to come into play. 
And because of the way the structures get all wonky, because you're, you're, you're filling multiple energy levels with each electron that you add and you build. So yeah, they'll give you D block and some of these transition metals here, they'll give you the Roman numeral of what charge it has to have. Column one and two, no, they expect you to know that. And the higher levels over here, three and four, they would expect you to know, you know, aluminum. Aluminum is a 3A element, 3A metal. All right. So take a look at on your own. The quiz will probably look very much like the on your own. What has been my pattern up to this point? Quizzes are basically the on your own questions, okay? Doesn't mean I'm going to give you these questions. I may. Or I may give you ones that look very similar to it because we haven't done a lot other than what you're going to see right here. Write the chemical names for the following compounds. So look at number one. It starts with a BA, right? What is that element? Now remember, these are ionic names, right? There is no barium dinitrate or nitrite, right? It's, that's not the way it works. These are ionic elements ionic molecules that have a covalent molecule subportion. So it's going to be an ionic name. This first one, what is NO3? It's nitrate, right? NO3 is nitrate. We had it on the board, but it's not there anymore. So what is Ba NO3 2? It's barium nitrate. That's it. It's barium nitrate. Pardon? BANO32. The metal starts, leads in the name. The BA is barium. The metal in ionic for naming gets its full, ion its full elemen elemental name, right? It's, it's potassium chloride. It's sodium hydroxide. It's, in this case, it's barium something. BA, barium something. The something is a nitrate polyatomic ion. So this is barium nitrate. The next one, NaClO3. The ClO3 is going to be your chlorate. Because it leads with sodium, it's sodium chlorate. It's the name of the molecule. 